Today I'm going to reveal to you a secret. The secret of how Oda creates such stunningly powerful flashbacks time and again. Because while he certainly has plenty of new ideas that he uses each time, almost every tragic backstory in One Piece is structured exactly the same way. It's a simple equation that Oda came up with the One Piece special, that Oda has used for 1100 chapters to produce heartbreaking backstory after heartbreaking backstory. And as many already feel that the Kuma backstory is the greatest of all backstories in One Piece so far, the simple reason that so many readers feel this way is because this is actually the first time that Oda is adding one more, unique new iteration to his formula. A change that elevates the storytelling of Kuma's flashback to something even more complex and arguably even more powerful than anything else that has come before. To understand the key difference in Kuma's backstory that makes it break the mold, we first have to break down what Oda's usual formula is. The same formula that he used for Nami, for Chopper, for Robin, for Law, and so on. Oda's secret formula for breaking readers' hearts. But before we get into it, make sure to subscribe. And I want to shout out Factor, which is the best meal prep service that I've ever had and the sponsor for this video. So Factor makes life really easy for me because I work a lot of hours and I don't have time to cook like at all, but Factor sends ready-made meals straight to my house that I can eat without ever having to worry about cooking or grocery shopping. Life is so much less stressful with Factor because I can just pick what food I like out of over 35 weekly options and I'm pretty much good to go. And the food is genuinely really tasty because it's prepared by professional chefs. On top of that, the meals are planned by nutritionists, so basically with Factor, I know that I'm getting to eat great dinners every night that are actually healthy for me and are going to keep me on a good diet. There's literally nothing more that I could ask for from a meal prep service, and the best part is that they now have gourmet plus options if you want really fancy food to treat yourself, with ingredients like truffle butter and dishes like steak and shrimp coming up right around the corner. So if you don't like cooking and if you don't wanna eat takeout, then you should honestly try Factor and just put your meals on autopilot. You won't have to worry about dinner ever again. Just head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code MORGE50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. That's factor75.com, link in the description below and code MORGE50 for 50% off. So that aside, for most every tragic backstory, Oda follows this simple formula. Dark, light, very dark. What does that mean? Basically, step one. Begin the backstory with the main character in a sad, somewhat tragic situation to begin with. Step two, introduce a ray of light into the character's life. Something that alleviates their sadness in some way and maybe even gives them fleeting hope and happiness. And step three, tear that ray of light away in the absolute most brutal manner possible, leaving the character far worse off and even more traumatized than they were at step one. It's a simple three-step process designed to perfectly emotionally manipulate the reader to feel absolutely heartbroken by the end of it. And why does this work? Because while just having something tragic happen to a character can be sad on its own, it is exponentially sadder to see someone in an already pitiful position, then be given a glimmer of hope, and then have that hope ripped away, ending up with an even worse life than they initially had. So let's briefly think back through all of One Piece's greatest backstories. Chopper's story begins with him in a dark place, becoming an outcast. After he eats the Hitohito no Mi, he is kicked out of his herd for being a freak, and is simultaneously attacked and driven away by humans for being a monster. Completely shunned and isolated by everyone as a young boy, this first dark phase of Chopper's story then transitions to him getting a ray of light in his life when he meets Hiroluk. Finally, someone who is able to provide him that unconditional love and acceptance that he yearned for for so long. And during this phase, Oda manipulates the reader by feeding us exactly what we wanted to see for Chopper, this period of happiness, this period where he is loved and taken care of and shown warmth and affection. During this period, we want to believe that all of Chopper's pain and trauma from his sad beginnings can go away. And just when everything finally seems to be better, Oda stomps all over that by killing Hiroluk and not only breaking Chopper by having him lose the one good thing he ever had in his life, but also making Chopper believe that he himself is the one responsible for killing his savior. Chopper's backstory is dark, then light, then very dark. One, two, three, start the character at rock bottom, have them climb a bit out of the hole, 
and then stomp them down and bury them even deeper than they started. It's pretty f***ed up, but that's why it works so well. Same thing with Nami. Hers is a much shorter backstory, but it begins with her having a sad breakdown over how poor her family is and how much she hates having no money. Then we have this heartwarming section where Nami learns how much Bellamere loves her, with Nami realizing the value of her family, while Bellamere also prepares an extravagant reconciliation meal for Nami. And then all of that wholesomeness is ruined by Arlong and his crew crashing the party and killing Bellamere in front of Nami, then enslaving Nami and the village and so on. Same thing with Robin, we begin her backstory with Robin being treated as an outcast and a freak, hated by her own adoptive parents, forbidden from becoming a scholar, feeling isolated and alone, and then she finally meets a friend. For the first time, someone who doesn't treat her as a freak, who encourages her, who teaches her how to laugh, who brightens up her sad life. And then immediately afterwards, she loses him, along with literally everybody she ever knew and the only family she ever had, and is labeled a criminal and and is then treated as a demon and an outcast by literally the entire world for the next 20 years. Same thing with Trafalgar Law, his backstory begins with the white lead disease, losing his parents, his sister and so on, left with a seemingly incurable illness, but then he meets Corazon who shows him kindness and compassion and actually breaks down his icy walls and gets through to his heart, and works tirelessly to give Law a second chance at life which he succeeds in doing. And then of course Oda kills off Corazon, with Law being the one responsible for his new father figure's death, the most cruel twist possible to Law's story after everything that Corazon did for him. Brooks is short, but follows a similar pattern of the beginning of the story being about the pain that he and his crew feel having to push Laboon away, and Laboon tragically following the ship. This then transitions to the happy phase of them finding a home for Laboon at the lighthouse, and having a happy farewell and a promise of reunion. And that dream of course then falling apart when the Rumbar pirates are all killed, leaving Brook the only survivor by himself for 50 years, unable to return to Laboon. Nolan and Kalgaris flashback. It begins with the heaviness of the Shandians dying to disease and having to make sacrifices, including Kalgaris' own daughter, then transitions to a period of friendship and joy when Nolan is able to cure the disease and gain Kalgaris' trust, but then of course ends in tragedy when the island is sent to the sky so Nolan and Kalgara can never meet again, Kalgara losing his land to the Skypeans, and Nolan being executed for being a liar. Otohime's story begins with her desperately trying day in and out to get people to sign the petition and everyone is refusing, with her tearfully crying about the hopelessness of never being able to live in the sun with the humans. But then, after saving a celestial dragon, she is able to return to Fishman Island with a single ray of hope for a brighter future. That actually unites the fishmen to believe in the humans and sign her petition. Only then, all of that progress is lost and society is actually set backwards when Otohime herself is assassinated, with all her efforts that she worked for her whole life being for nothing as fishmen go back to hating the humans more than ever. Kiros was a criminal, forced to fight for his life in the Colosseum for hundreds of matches. Then finally he was freed and he actually found love, and experienced true happiness for the first time. But inevitably it all ends with his love being taken from him, with her unable to even remember his name as she died, and Kiros himself permanently trapped as a disfigured toy, forgotten by all the people of Dressrosa. As you can see, the pattern is very, very blatant and consistent. Pretty much every single one of the most tragic, tearjerker backstories that we've ever had in One Piece has followed this same exact pattern of dark, light, very dark. Start with a sad situation to make you feel for the character, actually give the character hope, then crush that hope to make the character's story even more painful. Interestingly, a lot of the backstories in One Piece that are not considered quite as strong or iconic to readers are ones that are a bit more simple and straightforward and don't follow through on the full formula. Backstories where it's just a character in a relatively normal situation and then something bad happens to them. For example, Zoro is just a kid at a dojo and then his best friend and rival dies. Frankie is an apprentice at a shipyard and pretty happy doing what he does. Sure, he's technically an orphan, but that's not something that seems to actually bother him. And then of course, he loses his mentor Tom. Riku is a normal king beloved by his people and then loses it to Doflamingo. It's not that these aren't sad events, they are of course sad backstories, but they don't have quite the same emotional flow and build up 
as when Oda does his full pattern of taking a character through all three phases of his formula. Which is why these more straightforward backstories are not usually mentioned by readers as One Piece's best, compared to say Robins, Laws, etc. However, finally we have Kuma whose backstory is set to actually go one step beyond Oda's usual formula. See, Kuma's backstory is unique. It aims to tell a far more elaborate story than anything that's come before. Whereas something like Chopper or Nami's backstory is a look at the most devastating event in their life that shaped who they are today. With Kuma, we are not reading about just one formative event. Kuma's entire life is a tragedy. From his birth all the way to today, and indeed all the way up to his likely death looming around the corner. It's almost inaccurate to say that we are reading Kuma's backstory, rather we are simply reading his story. This is it. This is the full life and times of Bartholomew Kuma. We are getting everything from his start all the way to his end. And so, because the scope of what Oda is aiming to do here is so much more expansive and comprehensive, because he's genuinely telling a full life story for the first time, Oda is going above and beyond the usual backstory formula. You could say that with Kuma, Oda is actually doubling the pattern. See, Kuma's story starts with the usual expected darkness, and honestly the beginning phase of his backstory is just about as dark as it gets for One Piece, with Kuma not only born into slavery, but actually having both his parents die as slaves when he is still just a boy. Then we do get this period of light, a glimmer of joy as Kuma is able to actually escape slavery and enjoy life with Ginny. As they say, they've never been so happy. Kuma is able to actually build a life in Sorbet Kingdom and gain a purpose fighting alongside the revolutionary army to try and free people like he always dreamed of. But then that is all rendered moot when we get the Ginny incident. In the end, it was all too good to be true, and all the light in Kuma's life is snuffed out when Ginny is captured and then raped by a celestial dragon of all people. The very same evil that they once thought that they had escaped from. And then she is finally left to die shortly afterwards, used and discarded by the celestial dragon. Just like that, all the freedom and salvation that Kuma and Ginny were able to attain is rendered meaningless. In the end, Ginny died a victim of the Celestial Dragon's oppression, and Kuma was helpless to save her. Now, going along with Oda's usual pattern, Oda could have brought Kuma's story to a close right here. We got the dark beginning, then the period of light and hope, and finally the absolutely tragic, heartbreaking end, with Kuma losing the person closest to him in the worst way imaginable, just as most One Piece backstories conclude with. Indeed, the way that Kuma and Ginny's story ended, most would say that this is already just about the darkest that One Piece gets, but Oda is going even further this time. In an unprecedented move, he is looping the formula one more time around on top of what we've already gotten. Because after Ginny's death, now that Kuma feels that he has lost everything, now that he is a shell of himself, no longer even wanting to fight alongside the revolutionary army, he does actually gain one new source of light, and that is his daughter, Bonnie. Despite having experienced the pain of gaining a happy life with Ginny and then losing her forever, Kuma actually now is being put through a second run of that very same cycle, gaining a happy life with Bonnie that is yet again scheduled to end in tragedy. Kuma is happy as Bonnie's father, she is literally the only good thing left in his life, and he does get to enjoy raising her. Oda is putting Kuma through yet another cycle of the dark to light to finally very dark. In the wake of Kuma's great loss, he gives Kuma a period of fleeting happiness yet again, only to once again smash it to pieces even more harshly than before. Because we know how Kuma and Bonnie's story ends, we know that there is no happily ever after for them. We know that Kuma is ultimately reduced to a mindless slave for the Celestial Dragons. While Bonnie is the only good thing left in Kuma's life, she is torn away from him as well. When all of Kuma's life he fought for freedom, he will be reduced back to a mindless slave for the Celestial Dragons, suffering in a state far worse than he ever even did as a boy, turned into the most abused and humiliated slave in all of Marijua, unable to even think for himself with all of his will and individuality stripped from him. And the absolute most cruel part is we will likely see him die in this state as well. 
most likely in some type of final sacrifice that he uses his last ounce of free thought to pull off. This is the new, evolved formula of tragedy that Oda has concocted for Kuma. Not just the standard cycle that has devastated readers in the past, but actually doubling the cycle. Kuma begins life as a slave and loses both his parents, but then escapes, experiences freedom, and builds a life with Ginny, but then loses Ginny back to the very hell they escape from, and then loses her forever only to then be fed some last semblance of happiness once more in raising Bonnie, the only good thing left in his life. Yet finally, he will have to leave Bonnie behind to end up right back where he started, as a slave, and then lower than a slave, a mindless, soulless robot, and then finally, death. Dark, light, then very dark, then light, then finally extreme, extreme dark. This is all just a new level of storytelling from Oda. It's more elaborate, more layered, a deeper tragedy than anything ever written in One Piece so far. This is Oda's magnum opus. So tell me, do you think that Kuma's backstory is just a natural evolution of Oda's storytelling abilities? Or was Oda just always saving his most powerful and complex backstory for last? Let me know in the comments below, and if you enjoyed this video, then definitely like and subscribe. And you can get my extended thoughts on how Oda may top even this backstory on my weekly podcast by supporting me on Patreon. Link in the description below.